Welcome to the enigmatic world of Rasputin. Explore the life and legend of this mysterious figure whose influence defied explanation. Join us as we unravel the captivating tale of Rasputin, a man whose legacy continues to fascinate generations. Rasputin, born in 1869 in Siberia, was a mystic and self-proclaimed holy man. He gained influence in the court of Tsar Nicholas II and Tsarina Alexandra due to his perceived ability to heal their hemophiliac son, Alexei. His influence on the Russian royal family sparked controversy and fueled rumors of his control over political decisions. Grigory Yefimovich Rasputin was born a peasant in a small village in the Tobolsk region in the Russian Empire. According to official records, he was born on 9 January 1869 and christened the following day. He was named for St. Gregory of Nyssa, whose feast was celebrated on 10 January. There are few records of Rasputin's parents. His father, Yefim, was a peasant farmer and church elder who had been born in Pokrovskoye and married Rasputin's mother, Anna Parshukova, in 1863. Yefim also worked as a government courier, ferrying people and goods between Tobolsk and Tiumen. The couple had seven other children, all of whom died in infancy and early childhood. There may have been a ninth child, Feodosia. According to historian Joseph T. Fuhrman, Rasputin was certainly close to Feodosia and was godfather to her children. But the records that have survived do not permit us to say more than that. According to historian Douglas Smith, Rasputin's youth and early adulthood are a black hole about which we know almost nothing, though the lack of reliable sources and information did not stop others from fabricating stories about Rasputin's parents and his youth after his rise to prominence. Historians agree, however, that like most Siberian peasants, including his mother and father, Rasputin was not formally educated and remained illiterate well into his early adulthood. Local archival records suggest that he had a somewhat unruly youth, possibly involving drinking, small thefts, and disrespect for local authorities, but contain no evidence of his being charged with stealing horses, blasphemy, all major crimes later imputed to him as a young man. In 1886, Rasputin traveled to Abalak, 2,800 kilometers east of Moscow where he met a peasant girl named Praskovia Dubrovina. After a courtship of several months, they married in February 1887. Praskovia remained in Pokrovskoya throughout Rasputin's later travels and rise to prominence, and remained devoted to him until his death. The couple had seven children, though only three survived to adulthood Dmitri, Maria, and Varvara. In 1897, Rasputin developed a renewed interest in religion and left Pokrovskoye to go on a pilgrimage. His reasons are unclear. According to some sources, he left the village to escape punishment for his role in horse theft. Other sources suggest Rasputin had a vision of the Virgin Mary or of St. Simeon of Verkoturye, while still others suggest that his pilgrimage was inspired by a young theological student, Melody Zaborowski. Whatever his reasons, Rasputin cast off his old life. He was 28 years old, married 10 years, with an infant son and another child on the way. According to Smith, his decision could only have been occasioned by some sort of emotional or spiritual crisis. Rasputin had undertaken earlier shorter pilgrimages to the Holy Znamensky Monastery at Abalak and to Tobolsk's Cathedral. But his visit to the St. Nicholas Monastery at Verkoturye in 1897 transformed him. There, he met and was profoundly humbled by a staritz, an elder known as Makari. Rasputin may have spent several months at Verkoturya, and it was perhaps here that he learned to read and write. However, he later claimed that some of the monks at Verkoturya engaged in homosexuality and criticized monastic life as too coercive. He returned to Pokrovskoya a changed man, looking disheveled and behaving differently. He became a vegetarian, swore off alcohol, and prayed and sang much more fervently than he had in the past. Rasputin spent the years that followed as a stranic, a holy wanderer, leaving Pokrovskoya for months or even years at a time to wander the country and visit a variety of holy sites. 
It is possible he wandered as far as Mount Athos, the center of Eastern Orthodox monastic life in the 1900s. By the early 1900s, Rasputin had developed a small circle of followers, primarily family members and other local peasants, who prayed with him on Sundays and other holy days when he was in Pokrovskoye. Building a makeshift chapel in Yefim's root cellar, Rasputin was still living within his father's household at the time. The group held secret prayer meetings there. These meetings were the subject of some suspicion and hostility from the village priest and other villagers. It was rumored that female followers were ceremonially washing Rasputin before each meeting, that the group sang strange songs, and even that Rasputin had joined the Klisti, a religious sect whose ecstatic rituals were rumored to include self-flagellation and sexual orgies. According to Furman, however, repeated investigations failed to establish that Rasputin was ever a member of the sect, and rumors that he was a Klist appear to have been unfounded. Word of Rasputin's activity and charisma began to spread in Siberia during the early 1900s. At some point during 1904 or 1905, he traveled to the city of Kazan, where he acquired a reputation as a wise staritz who could help people resolve their spiritual crises and anxieties. Despite rumors that Rasputin was having sex with female followers, he made a favorable impression on several local religious leaders. Among these were Archimandrite Andre and Bishop Christanos, who gave Rasputin a letter of recommendation to Bishop Sergei, the rector of the Theological Seminary at the Alexander Nevsky Monastery, and arranged for him to travel to St. Petersburg. Upon arriving at the Alexander Nevsky Lavra, Rasputin was introduced to church leaders, including Archimandrite Theophan, inspector of the Theological Seminary, who was well-connected in St. Petersburg society and later served as confessor to the imperial family. Theophan was so impressed with Rasputin that he invited him to stay in his home. He went on to become one of Rasputin's most important friends in St. Petersburg, gaining him entry to many of the influential salons where the local aristocracy gathered for religious discussions. It was through these meetings that Rasputin attracted some of his early and influential followers, many of whom would later turn against him. Alternative religious movements such as spiritualism and theosophy had become popular among St. Petersburg's aristocracy before Rasputin's arrival, and many of the aristocracy were intensely curious about the occult and the supernatural. Rasputin's ideas and strange manners made him the subject of intense curiosity among the city's elite, who according to Foreman were bored, cynical, and seeking new experiences during this period. Rasputin's appeal may have been enhanced by the fact that he was also a native Russian, unlike other self-described holy men, such as Nizier Antelme Philippe and Gerard Onkos, who had previously been popular in St. Petersburg. According to Furman, Rasputin stayed in St. Petersburg for only a few months on his first visit and returned to Pokrovskoye in the fall of 1903. Smith, however, argues that it is impossible to know whether Rasputin stayed in St. Petersburg or returned to Pokrovskoye at some point between his first arrival and 1905. Regardless, by 1905 Rasputin had formed friendships with several members of the aristocracy, including the Black Princesses, Militsa, and Anastasia of Montenegro, who had married cousins of Tsar Nicholas II, Grand Duke Peter Nikolaevich, and Prince George Maximilianovich Romanovsky, and were instrumental in introducing Rasputin to the Tsar and his family. Rasputin first met Nicholas on 1 November 1905 at the Peterhof Palace. The Tsar recorded the event in his diary, writing that he and his empress consort, Alexandra Feodorovna had made the acquaintance of a man of God, Grigory, from Tobolsk province. Rasputin returned to Pokrovskoye shortly after their first meeting and did not return to St. Petersburg until July 1906. On his return, he sent Nicholas a telegram asking to present the Tsar with an icon of St. Simeon of Verkoturye. He met with Nicholas and Alexandra on 18th July and again in October when he first met their children. At some point, Nicholas and Alexandra became convinced that Rasputin possessed the miraculous power to heal their only son, 
Tsesarevich Alexei Nikolaevich, who suffered from hemophilia. Historians disagree over when this happened. According to Orlando Figues, Rasputin was first introduced to the Tsar and Tsarina as a healer who could help their son in November 1905, while Joseph T. Furman has speculated that it was in October 1906 that Rasputin was first asked to pray for the health of Alexei. Much of Rasputin's influence with the imperial family stemmed from the belief by Alexandra and others that he had on several occasions eased Alexei's pain and stopped his bleeding. According to historian Mark Farrow, the Tsarina had a passionate attachment to Rasputin, believing he could heal her son's affliction. Harold Shukman wrote that Rasputin became an indispensable member of the royal entourage. In November 1906, Rasputin suddenly paid a visit to the Baratinsky family in Kazan and told them he could read people's minds. Olga Ilyin's description of Rasputin and his behavior in visits to the imperial court is a small but no doubt valuable contribution to history. Alexandra could not be blamed for seeing Rasputin as a miracle man. Rasputin would come in, walk up to the patient, look at him, and spit. The bleeding would stop in no time. How could the Empress not trust Rasputin after that? Historian Robert K. Massey has called Alexei's recovery one of the most mysterious episodes of the whole Rasputin legend. The cause of his recovery is unclear. Massey speculated that Rasputin's suggestion not to let doctors disturb Alexei had aided his recovery by allowing him to rest and heal, or that his message may have aided Alexei's recovery by calming his mother and reducing the Tsarevich's emotional stress. Alexandra believed that Rasputin had performed a miracle and concluded that he was essential to Alexei's survival. Some writers and historians, such as Pharaoh, claim that Rasputin stopped Alexei's bleeding on other occasions through hypnosis. It was whispered in society that Rasputin had seduced not only Alexandra, but also the four grand duchesses. Nicholas ordered Rasputin to leave St. Petersburg for a time, much to Alexandra's displeasure, and Rasputin went on a pilgrimage to Palestine. Despite the scandal, the imperial family's association with Rasputin continued until his murder on 17 December 1916. Our friend is so contented with our girlies, says they have gone through heavy courses for their age and their souls have much developed. Alexandra wrote to Nicholas on 6 December 1916. In his memoirs, A. A. Mordvinov reported that the four grand duchesses appeared, cold and visibly terribly upset by Rasputin's death, and sat huddled up closely together on a sofa in one of their bedrooms on the night they received the news. Mordvinov reported that the young women were in a gloomy mood and seemed to sense the political upheaval that was about to be unleashed. Rasputin was buried with an icon signed on its reverse side by the Grand Duchesses and their mother. The imperial family's belief in Rasputin's healing powers brought him considerable status and power at court. Nicholas appointed Rasputin his lampadnik, lamplighter, charged with keeping the lamps lit before religious icons in the palace, which gained him regular access to the palace and imperial family. By December 1906, Rasputin had become close enough to ask a special favor of the Tsar, that he be permitted to change his surname to Rasputin Novi, Rasputin knew. Nicholas granted the request, and the name change was speedily processed, suggesting that Rasputin already had the Tsar's favor at that early date. Rasputin used his position to full effect, accepting bribes and sexual favors from admirers and working diligently to expand his influence. Rumors multiplied that Rasputin had assaulted female followers and behaved inappropriately on visits with the imperial family, and particularly with Nicholas's teenage daughters, Olga and Tatiana. The murder of Rasputin is surrounded by a mix of legend and historical accounts. According to popular belief and various historical records, Rasputin's death was a rather convoluted and dramatic event. In the late hours of December 30, 1916, Rasputin was invited to the home of Prince Felix Yusupov, a nobleman who was part of a group of conspirators plotting against him. 
they lured Rasputin to the palace under the guise of a social gathering. Once there, Rasputin was offered poisoned wine and cakes, supposedly containing lethal doses of cyanide. However, to the surprise of the conspirators, the poison seemed to have little effect on him. Fearing that Rasputin was indestructible, Yusupov and his accomplices shot him multiple times. Yet Rasputin managed to survive the gunshots and attempted to flee. However, the group pursued him, continuing their assault. Finally, Rasputin was shot once more and beaten severely before being thrown into the icy Neva River. The exact sequence of events and the number of shots fired, as well as the extent of Rasputin's injuries before his death, have been debated. Some reports suggest he died from drowning in the river, while others claim that he succumbed to the gunshot wounds. Ultimately, Rasputin's murder remains shrouded in mystery and the subject of various interpretations, contributing to the legend and intrigue surrounding his life and death. Rasputin was buried on 2nd of January at a small church that Virubova had been building at Tsarskoye Selo. The funeral was attended only by the imperial family and a few of their intimates. Rasputin's wife, mistress and children were not invited, although his daughters met with the imperial family at Virubova's home later that day. The imperial family planned to build a church over Rasputin's gravesite. However, his body was exhumed and burned by a detachment of soldiers on the orders of Alexander Kerensky shortly after. Nicholas abdicated the throne in March 1917, so that his grave would not become a rallying point for supporters of the former empire.